You may be seated today. So last Sunday, we began a series that we've called City Changers. We're in the midst of the month of November, and we are celebrating with hundreds of churches across Broward County what we're calling Love South Florida, and uh, all kinds of activities are taking place, and Pastor Brad will say more about that at the conclusion of the service. Last week, we were challenged to see our community as Jesus sees it. Remember, there were three things that we talked about. In order for us to be city changers, we have to see like Jesus, we have to love like Jesus, and we have to act like Jesus. I was really encouraged because several of you came and talked to me that as a result of last week's message, you actually walked your street, and you uh, walked through your street praying and asking God to do a work of grace on your street and in your community. And we believe with all of our heart that if we're going to see a movement of the Holy Spirit of God in our community, that it's going to come through prayer. So I'd encourage you, if you did that this past week, let me encourage you to do it again this week. We, By the way, we have door hangers at the welcome table that simply say, we're here for you, that you can place some doors in your street and let people know all the different ministries that Hollywood Community Church has available to them. So today I want to begin with a verse, a very common verse. As a matter of fact, Bible Gateway says that this is one of, if not the most popular verse in the United States at this time. So it's Jeremiah chapter 29 and verse 11. Let me read it. This may be your favorite verse. When we say it's the most popular verse, it's, it's, it's popular in the sense that many people claim this as their life verse. Jeremiah 29, 11 says, For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans for welfare and not for evil, to give you future and a hope. This verse is often quoted to people who are searching for God's will because the verse says that God has plans for you. This verse is often shared with people who are struggling financially because the verse says that God has plans to prosper you and not harm you. That's the translation that's in the NIV. This verse is claimed by people who find themselves in a hopeless situation because the verse ends saying God has plans to give you hope and a future. Seldom, though, is this verse studied within its context. Often we pull out that, that, that great verse that speaks to our heart, but rarely do we look at the context in which that verse finds itself in. It's interesting that the you in that verse is not singular. At times we apply it singularly, but the you in that verse is plural. God is not directing that promise to an individual, but as you will see in the context, God is directing that promise to a group of people. You might sit back today and say, okay, Brian, tell me then, who is the group? We'll get there in just a few moments as we study the passage. So if you've read the book of Jeremiah, and the book of Jeremiah is one of my favorite books in the Bible, you're familiar with the fact that in the first 28 chapters of this book, Jeremiah continues to give these prophecies that are discouraging and some would say defeating to the nation of Israel. Because Jeremiah not only calls the children of Israel to repentance, but Jeremiah repeatedly tells them destruction is coming. The enemy is coming. As it were, the Babylonians are coming. And the Babylonians are going to override, they're going to raid this city, and they are going to take you captive. Time after time after time, in the first 28 chapters, we find Jeremiah giving this message, not of hope, but this message of destruction to the children of Israel. And by the way, Jeremiah was critiqued, he was criticized for that prophecy, and he was not only criticized for the prophecy, but he was imprisoned for the prophecy. 
If you read Jeremiah, and I love reading the story, he was taken and he was, he was lowered down into a cistern of mud. And he stayed in that cistern for a certain period of time, just sitting in yucky mud. Why? Because he was faithful in proclaiming to the Israelites what God told him to say. Even though there were other false prophets who uh, contradicted what Jeremiah was saying. Jeremiah was saying, saying doom and gloom and destruction are coming. And other false prophets were saying, no, don't listen to Jeremiah. God wants to bless you. God's not going to send us into captivity. Sure enough, just as Jeremiah prophesied, in the year 597 B.C., the Babylonians attack Jerusalem, killing many of the inhabitants of Jerusalem and taking the majority of them captive, transporting them away from their city, away from their home, away from their families, transporting them to the city of Babylon. If you're familiar with the story of Daniel, Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were part of that exile community that, that were lifted from Israel and taken to Babylon. And so if you read, I'm going to warn you now, if you grab your Bibles, and I would encourage you today, and you start reading through the first 28 chapters of Jeremiah, you're going to sit back and think, oh my word, this is like one of the most discouraging books ever, even though there are some great truths that are found in it. Hold on, though, because when you come to chapter 29, Jeremiah's message completely changes. One commentator says this, I love that he says that Jeremiah morphs from a prophet of doom and gloom to a travel agent. <laughs> Because all of a sudden, he's warning them what's going to come, and now you get to 29, and he starts telling them how great their life is going to be in the city of Babylon, telling them that they're in Babylon, in this foreign city, God wants to use them, and God wants to bless them, encouraging them, as it were, with the fact that Babylon is a great place to live. <laughs> Could you imagine if we were invaded by another country, and not only were we invaded, but the majority of us were taken captive, and then someone stands up and has the audacity to say, man, in that new country where you're a captive, you're going to have a great life there. And I'm telling you, it's going to be just a great experience. We'd look at that person as if they had four eyes and horns, thinking, what in the world are you talking about? That's exactly what takes place in Jeremiah chapter 29. So if you grab your Bibles, turn with me to Jeremiah chapter 29, and I want to read the first 13 verses. We'll put verse 11 in context, and I think we'll see how you and I can make a difference in our city. Just as Jeremiah encouraged the Jews, the exiled Jews, to make a difference in their city, you and I can make a difference in Hollywood as well. Notice verse 1 of Jeremiah 29, we'll put it up on the screen. These are the words of the letter that Jeremiah the prophet sent from Jerusalem to the surviving elders of the exile. Stop there for just a second because you're going to notice two things. So Jeremiah, for some reason, was not one of the exiles. So Jeremiah was able to stay in Jerusalem. So, so Jeremiah's in Jerusalem writing to the people who had been taken captive, who were exiles, now living in Babylon. You'll notice another part of that phrase. He says, these are the words of the letter that Jeremiah the prophet sent from Jerusalem to the what? Surviving elders. So, so no doubt the Israelites had gone through horrific experiences. Not only had they been invaded, but many of their kinsmen, many of their family members, many of their contemporaries were killed in the process of the invasion. And the great majority of them who were not killed, who survived, were then transported to Babylon. Notice what he says, to the surviving elders of the exiles and to the priests, the prophets, and all the people who Nebuchadnezzar had taken into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. Jump down to verse 4 with me, please. Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, to all the exiles whom I have sent into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. A remarkable prophecy. Build houses and live in them. Plant gardens and eat their produce. Take wives and have sons and daughters. 
Take wives for your sons and daughters and give your daughters in marriage that they may bear sons and daughters and multiply there. And do not decrease, verse 7, but seek the welfare of the city where I had sent you. Now once again, where are they? Babylon. Who are the Babylonians? Their friends? No, their enemies. And so Jeremiah tells them, seek the welfare of the city where I have sent you into exile and pray to the Lord on its behalf. On whose behalf? The Babylonians. The city who had killed their family members. The people who had taken them captive. He said, pray to the Lord on its behalf for in its welfare you will find your welfare. For thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, do not let your prophets and your diviners who are among you deceive you and do not listen to the dreams that they dream. For it is a lie that they are prophesying to you in the name of the Lord. I did not send them, says the Lord. So there were still false prophets who were saying, okay, God brought you here, but guess what? Really quick, he's gonna send us home. Don't, don't unpack your suitcases. Don't, don't buy a house. Don't sign a long-term contract. God's going to send us home. Jeremiah said, their lies. Don't listen to them. Verse 10, for thus says the Lord, when 70 years are completed for Babylon, I will visit you and I will fulfill to you my promise and bring you back to this place. So Jeremiah says they'd be there how long? 70 years. What's the average lifespan? Somewhere around what? Some 70 years. So, so here's what Jeremiah is telling them. Unpack your bags, make yourself comfortable, because the majority of you are going to die there. You're not going to go home. And it's after that verse that he says in verse 11, for I know the plans that I have for you, declares the Lord, plans for welfare and not for evil, to give you a future and a hope. Notice verses 12 and 13. Then you will call upon me and come and pray to me, and I will what? I will hear you. You will seek me, and you will find me when you seek me with all of your heart. So would you pray with me just one more time? Holy Spirit of God, help us to understand the truth of these verses. Help us not only to understand them, but help us to apply them to our lives. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So, so these verses are written, first of all, to captives, but these verses are also written to city dwellers. They're, they're written to people that we would classify as urbanites, people who live in the big city, people just like us. When this was written, Babylon was the largest city in the world. So, so how are believers supposed to live in a city? How are believers supposed to live in a city in which the majority of their neighbors think differently than they think? How are they supposed to live and work and operate in a city that the culture of that city goes against their culture? The Israelites were exiles there. How were they supposed to live in this city that was different than theirs? Now, let me say this. This isn't a one-to-one -one comparison. Obviously, you and I are, the majority of us are not Israelites. Secondly, the Israelites would only be there for 70 years. There was hope that, that they were going to return back to their permanent home. You and I, on the other hand, look forward to the day when Jesus establishes his kingdom here. And so I say that, that, that you and I have more of a motivation than even the Jews in Babylon to seek the welfare of the city where God has placed us. Peter does say that we're exiles, and others would say that our new home is the Jerusalem that will descend out of heaven, but the simple truth is this. We believe with all of our heart that God is going to establish his kingdom here, and we believe his kingdom has already been established. We've talked about that, that already not yet principle, and you and I are citizens of the kingdom of God living in Hollywood, Florida. So how can we live out the principles of the kingdom? 
How can you and I live for our king in this city in which the majority of the people who live around us think differently than we do, act differently than we do, have a different worldview than we have? How can we represent Jesus and how can we see transformation in our city? I would submit to you that the answer is not for us to run away. The answer is not for us to go somewhere mid-state, build a commune, build a wall all around us, and let's protect ourselves from the evils of the community. That's not what we're supposed to do. As a matter of fact, we're supposed to live in the community where God has placed us, and we are to be salt and light there. So as citizens of the kingdom, how can we seek the welfare of the city? There's several principles that I want to draw from this and apply to us as we strive to be city changers and community changers. The first principle is this. It's a little difficult to swallow. It was for the Israelites, but the first principle is this. Make yourself at home in the city. Make yourself at home. Admittedly, cities are tough places to live, are they not? We talked about that last week. How many of us would rather escape to the country? We all probably would. Your ideal place is some house on a lake somewhere with beautiful foliage all around you. And, 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 and the desire to escape is a very real desire. But I believe with all of my heart that just as God told the Jews through Jeremiah, make yourselves at home in the city, God is challenging us to do the exact same thing, even though cities are difficult places. I read and studied quite a bit on cities this week, so let me read you a couple of humorous quotes. So Reverend John Todd, who lived in the late 1800s in the United States, was a pastor. Notice this this quote that he said, let no man who values his soul or his body ever go into a great city to become its pastor. (laughs) I don't know, maybe I should have taken that advice. I'm not exactly sure, huh? Ralph Waldo Emerson, who is one of the great poets of the United States, lived in Philadelphia, and he said this, if all the world was Philadelphia, suicide would be extremely common. (laughs) All right, now, I don't think that's a blight necessarily on Philadelphia. I think that's a blight on city living. Saying it is what? It It is difficult to live in the city. Think with me today. Although Hollywood is a paradise and the surrounding communities around us. We talked about that last week. Although it's a paradise to many, there are many who live in our community who feel as if they're living in exile. So, said, Brian, what are you talking about? What are you talking about? Man, I, I did a lot of research in our community this week, and I walked away with a broken heart for the community in which we live. Do you realize that 16.2% of our community, the people that live around us, live under the poverty level? That's almost one in five people who live in our community live in the poverty or under the poverty level. I was surprised to see that the, the demographic of our community, which is suffering more than any other, are women, specifically single women. The largest demographic living in poverty in our community are females ages 45 to 54. The second largest demographic of people living in poverty in our community are females ages 55 to 64. The third largest demographic of people living in in poverty in our community are females ages 25 through 34. And I sat back and thought, oh, Lord, what in the world are we doing to minister to these ladies, these women who live in our community, who are living in this beautiful paradise. But for many of them, it's as if they live in exile. We could go on and on. The city of Hollywood has one of the highest uses of opiates in the state of Florida. And I could go on and talk about crime, and I could talk about different things. Don't misunderstand me this morning. Uh, I'm not saying, I'm not trying to paint this picture that Hollywood is a desperate place and that you and I should hop on the first flight out of here. That's not what I'm saying today, nor am I, not, am I discouraging you to live here. I'm actually saying the opposite. And if you have your outline, the first thing that I put under that point is this. As followers of Jesus Christ, we must purposefully live in the city. Let me say that again. We must live here purposefully. 
We must live here with intentionality, realizing as we talked about last week that God has placed us in a mission field, on a mission field, and we have people all around us who desperately need loved, cared for, helped, and provided for. Imagine once again the reaction of Jeremiah's command to the Israelites who were living in the ghettos of Babylon. If you think that they were living in beautiful condos along the Tigris River, you're mistaken. The Israelites were living in the ghettos of Babylon. They, they, they were languishing in poverty. They were complaining about the crime rate. No doubt they were unhappy with the Babylonian school system. They wanted to go back home where the food was better, where the culture was better, where the style of living was better. And Jeremiah looks at them and he says this, build houses, put down roots, establish a life in the city, realize that this is the city where God has placed you. As a matter of fact, he tells the Jews, he said, you're going to be here for the next 70 years. Make this your home. You see, church, here's what I believe. I believe that in order for us to reach the cities, we have to have the exact same mentality. Tim Tim Keller in his book, City Church, outlines this beautifully, talking about if we're ever going to transform the cities, we have to have the conviction that God has placed us here. Ronald J. Sider in his book, The State of of Evangelical Concern, Evangelical Social Concern, says this. I put the quote up on the screen. Evangelicals must reverse the continuing evangelical flight from the cities. Tens of thousands of evangelicals ought to move back into the city. If just 1% of evangelicals living outside the inner city had the faith and the courage to move back in, evangelicals would fundamentally alter the history of urban America. What is he talking about? He's talking about living where God has placed us with purpose, living where God has placed us with intentionality instead of longing to live somewhere else, realizing that God has placed us here in His sovereignty, in His plan for our lives. Just as He placed the Jews in Babylon, He has placed you here, and He has placed me here, and He has placed us here with and for a purpose. You see, the second thing that I would say is this. As followers of Jesus Christ, we must intentionally get involved in our city. We must do it with purpose. We must do it with intentionality. Jeremiah's exhortation tells the Jews to get fully involved in Babylon. They were to become involved in its life. They were to become involved in its work. They were to work in it. They were to be, (coughs) excuse me, praying for it as well, as we'll see in just a few moments. Now, obviously, that passage was written at a different time, in a different culture, and a different place. But the text gives us some ideas what you and I can do to make a difference in our community. Let me just list a bunch of things, and these are just a few of the many things that we could do to make a difference in our community. But, 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 But here's what Jeremiah's telling the Jews, and I believe what the Holy Spirit would say to us. Get involved in community development. Join in your community association. So many times as believers, we back away from everything. All we want to do is get involved in church stuff, and we back away from the community to which we are supposed to be salt and life. Adapt to the food. He tells tells the Jews living there, he said, plant gardens. Eat from the food that is produced from your gardens. Go about business as usual. He tells them, get married. Have kids. Have your kids get married. Produce grandkids. Those of us who are grandparents would say amen to that, right? I think he would tie right in with what we preached about in our last series. Realize that your job is your calling. 
And the place where God has placed you in, uh, in your work, your job, what you do from Monday to Friday or Monday to Saturday or whatever your work schedule is, realize that God has placed you there for a purpose, as we'll see in just a moment, to make our community flourish. And so the place in which we live might experience shalom, might experience the peace of God. Catch this. Here's what I believe Jeremiah is saying, and I think I'm going to put it up on the screen. So building Jesus-focused, church-committed, neighbor-loving families is one of the greatest things that we can do for our community. Did did you catch that? Because we sit back and think, okay, what? What in the world can we do for Hollywood, or what can we do for Pembroke Pines, or, or, uh, or, or Davy or Cooper City, or wherever it is that we live? What can we do to really make a difference there? Here, here's what Jeremiah is saying. Build a family that loves Jesus. Build a family that is committed to Jesus, that is committed to the church, that loves its neighbor, and make a difference where God has planted you. We talked about, we asked you a few weeks ago to take your, your hand and just talk about the five areas of, of your life in which God wants you to flourish, home and work and self and community and church. Realize that that, that is the world in which God has placed you. And God desires for you to flourish in that world and represent Him in that world and be a citizen of the kingdom of God in that world. Here's what... Here's what he's saying. He's saying, make your home in the city in which you are living. He says a second thing. Thank you, Brad. Didn't even ask for it. Look at that. Thank you. I don't think I needed it, but I'll take it. He says the second thing in the passage. And this is really interesting. He says, seek the welfare of of the city. If you have your Bibles or your electronic device in front of you, no, notice verse 7, because notice what he says, and I, 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 I want to read it like it is in RESV, and then I want to explain it just a little bit. He says, but seek the welfare of the city where I sent you into exile, and pray to the Lord on its behalf, for in its welfare you will find your welfare. We read that, and we say, okay, cool, I get that. The word welfare is found three times in that verse. Did you see it? I underlined it in my Bible. Seek the welfare, pray for its welfare, for it's in its welfare you will find your welfare. It's really interesting. You know what the Hebrew word for welfare that is found three times in that verse is? You say, Brian, I don't know Hebrew. You don't, but you know this word. It's the word shalom, which is the Hebrew word for peace. Let's read it again. So, so here's what he's saying. So, but seek the shalom of the city where I've sent you into exile and pray to the Lord on its behalf for in its shalom you will find your shalom. That's exactly what Jeremiah is saying. The word shalom, if you're unfamiliar with it, means well-being. It means contentment. It means wholeness. It means health. It means prosperity. It means safety. It means rest. You say, Brian, there's a lot of definitions there. It is. You know what it means? It means flourishing. It means to have flourished. We, when we use the word peace, we only think about freedom from safety. And that is one small part of the definition. The word peace has the idea of flourishing in every aspect of your life. Thus, the five aspects. God wants you to flourish in all of those aspects. So what does that mean for us? in the community where we live, in the city where we live. Here's what it means if you have your outline. As citizens of the kingdom, you should work towards the flourishing of your city. As a church, our desire should be that Hollywood flourishes, that Broward County flourishes, that South Florida flourishes. That's what he says. Seek the the welfare, seek the shalom, seek the flourishing of the city where God has placed you. How do we do that? So starting this afternoon or starting tomorrow morning, how do we do that? 
Okay, let's just talk through that. Let's flesh that out for just a second. How do we do that? Get to know your neighbors. Become a good neighbor. We talked about that several weeks ago about how, how poorly we uh, communicate and get to know our neighbors. Get to know your neighbors. Become a good neighbor to them. Find someone in your community to whom you can minister. A single mom, maybe. Kids that need to be tutored. Senior adults who need to be taken to the doctor. Immigrants who need to adjust. Food-deprived families who need food. Be a neighbor. Be Jesus to the people in your community. Take a moment today at the end of the service and look at the various community organizations that we have represented in the back. We're striving our best to partner with community organizations, whether it's Hispanic Unity, whether it's the Boys and Girls Clubs of Broward County, whatever it is, and, and, and we have several of them that are, that are back there. You might sit back and say, well, Brian, those aren't all Christian organizations. No, but they're all organizations that are doing a great job in our community. And they're all organizations that need to be... Uh, uh, partnered with and by churches and believers just like us. The idea of seeking the welfare of others, by the way, is not just an Old Testament principle. We find it throughout the New Testament. Let me show you two verses that Paul used in Galatians chapter 6 and verse 10. Paul says, so then as we have opportunity, let us do good to whom? Whom does he say? Let us do good to Everyone. So let us do good to the people whom we like, and let us do good to the people whom we don't like, right? We do the good, we do good to the people with whom we get along, but we also do good to people with whom we don't get along. As we have opportunity, let us do good to everyone, especially those of the household of faith. Philippians chapter 2 and verse 4, our theme this year is to live generously. And living generously goes far beyond what we financially give. It talks about us living our life for the benefit of others. And Paul says in Philippians chapter 2 and verse 4, let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of whom? Others. And so we live our lives looking how we can be a blessing to others. Realizing that tomorrow morning I'm a representative of Jesus Christ and I want to be a blessing to somebody else. And Tuesday I'm a representative of Jesus Christ and I want to be a blessing to someone else. And so I look for opportunities to be generous, to be kind, to be forgiving, to be caring, to see them, love them, and act towards them as Jesus would and as Jesus would have me to do. You see, we seek the welfare of our city when we work towards the flourishing of our city. That's not just a Sunday activity. That's just not a Hollywood Community Church sponsored activity. That's you and I living our whole lives, realizing who we are, where we are, and what God has called us to do, and who God has called us to be. But we also need to realize the second point there is we need to realize that as the Prince of Siloam, only Jesus is the one who can bring real peace. We see that throughout the scripture. Isaiah 9, 6 refers to the Messiah, refers to Jesus as the Prince of Peace. I love this passage. Pastor Jose is going to speak next Sunday on this passage in Ephesians chapter 2, so I don't want to take any of his uh, shebang that he's going to be talking about, but notice Ephesians chapter 2, verses 13 and 14. But now in Christ Jesus, you who were once brought near by the blood of Christ, for he himself is our, what? Peace who has made us both one and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility. And so guess what we're going to talk about next week? We're going to talk about the things that divide us as a community. The things that, that tend to put one group of people on one side and another group of people on the other side. We're going to talk about how is the body of Christ. We're allowed to have those differences of opinion. But in Jesus Christ, we all what? We all come together. And we're all unified in Christ. Why? Because Jesus is the Prince of Shalom. He is the one who brings peace. He is the one who causes us to flourish. 
So I say this, real peace, real racial harmony, real political unity, real shalom can only be experienced as we, as we embrace Jesus, the Prince of Shalom. And Jeremiah reiterates that truth in these verses. He says that we should do a third thing. So in order to be city changers, we must make ourselves at home in the place where God has placed us. We must seek the welfare, the shalom of our city. But he tells us to do a third thing. He tells us to pray for our city. Notice verse 7 once again. We've already alluded to it several times. But seek the welfare of the city where I've sent you into exile and pray to the Lord on its behalf. Think with me today, can you imagine how hard it was for the Jews in exile to pray for the peace of Babylon? Pray for the shalom of Babylon? You've got to be kidding me. If I had a chance and I had a knife in my hand, I'd put it right in Nebuchadnezzar's chest. He killed my family. He uprooted me from my life. He's changed us completely. Our life is ruined. Pray for the shalom of Babylon? You've got to be kidding me. That's exactly what Jeremiah, what God told the Jews to do through Jeremiah. Pray to the Lord on its behalf. And don't just pray that they get what they deserve. Pray for its what? Its welfare. Pray for its shalom. It's flourishing, it's contentment, it's peace, it's well-being, it's safety. It's interesting, Jeremiah chapter 29 and verse 7 is the only verse in the entire Old Testament in which God's people are explicitly told to pray for their enemies. We find a few verses in the New Testament, but this is the only one in the Old Testament. So, so what are the applications for us? couple of things I said this and catch this church prayer is the civic and spiritual duty of every follower of Jesus Christ let me say it again prayer is the civic and spiritual duty of every follower of Jesus let me read you a verse Paul's words in first Timothy chapter 2 verses 1 and 2 and we'll put them in historical context Notice what Paul says. We'll put it up on the screen. 1 Timothy 2, 1 and 2. Paul says, first of all, I urge that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgivings be made for all people, for kings, and for all who are in high positions, that we may lead a peaceful and quiet life, godly and dignified in every way. Now, on the surface, that makes sense because we live in a secure country a democratic country where we experience safety. And although we might not agree with all of our politicians, we probably can swallow praying for them. But I would remind you that Paul was writing to people that were living in the Roman Empire. Christians living in the Roman Empire. Depending upon when Bible scholars date 1 Timothy, it's a good chance that Nero or one of his predecessors was king, was emperor of the Roman Empire. You say, Brian, what's that mean? They persecuted Christians. Remember, remember the Roman Colosseum? Where, where Christians were placed in the middle of the Roman Colosseum with what? With lions. They were beat to death and they were killed. You see, it's that administration that the Apostle Paul encourages Christians to what? Pray for kings. As a matter of fact, not just for kings, pray for everybody who is in a high position of authority. Why? So that we may lead a peaceable and quiet, godly and dignified life in every way. Well, church, let me say this, and I, I, I know I'm going to step on a few toes, but I'm going to do it with love, all right? The command is not to pray just for those for whom you voted or for those with whom you agree. Paul's exhortation to Timothy was to pray for even those leaders with whom we disagree. To pray for those leaders that are even out looking for our harm 
as followers of Jesus Christ, as citizens, not of this kingdom, but citizens of a kingdom far greater than this kingdom. A kingdom, by the way, that one day is going to absorb all of this kingdom. Paul says, pray for your leaders. And pray that God does a work in their lives and God does a work through their lives. Church, let me give you an exhortation. What if all of us committed to pray for our mayor, for our congressional leaders, for our commissioners, for our representatives, both local, statewide, and national? What if we as a church took the command seriously and we cried out to God for our community? Do you believe that God could answer our prayer? Do you believe that God would answer our prayer? Do you think it would make a difference? You see, in order, and I believe this with all of my heart, church, if we are going to see a movement of the Spirit of God in the city of Hollywood, it's going to happen as we fall on our knees and we beg the Holy Spirit of God to do a work in our hearts and we beg the Holy Spirit of God to tear down even the bitterness and the hardness that we have and we pray for God to unify us. Not that we all agree together. There's not going to be a kumbaya moment until Jesus comes back. But for us to sit back and realize for the sake of the King them for the sake of Jesus, for the sake of our community. God, we pray for the welfare of our community. And we pray for all of those who are in authority. God, do what only you can do. We beg you as an all-powerful, sovereign God to show your presence to show your power in our community. Wouldn't it be great if God did something in our community that became an example to the rest of the United States and to the rest of the world? Church, do you believe God can do that? I do. I believe he can. He's the one that says, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and turn from their wicked way, seek my face. God says, I will do a work from heaven. Or I, I messed up the verse, but you know the verse. God says, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to do a work in your midst. How can we see city change? Pray for the welfare of your community. And two more things. i got to be done. Two more things. Let me show you. Oh, or the, there's a second point under there. First of all, prayer is the civic spiritual duty of every follower of Jesus. The second thing is this. Pray for your, or to pray for your city is to pray for you and your family. He says this, for in praying for its welfare, you find your welfare. Not an egotistical prayer. It's not. It's an illustration of the saying that a rising tide lifts all boats, right? So as God blesses our community, he blesses us. As God lowers the crime rate in our community, he blesses us. As God causes our community to flourish, He blesses us. As God elevates His name and makes Himself known in our community, He blesses us. You see, a prayer for our community is not just a prayer for our community, but it's a prayer for us as well. Let me challenge you to pray for your city. And let's pray for God to do a work of grace in our midst. There's a fourth thing. Let me mention it quickly. The fourth is this. Trust, God, trust God's plans for you and your city. Trust God's plans. As we mentioned in the beginning of the message, Jeremiah 29, 11 is found in the middle of an exhortation that we wouldn't like. Imagine you're in a foreign country far away from home, don't even know what's taking place to your family members who are back in Jerusalem. Remember, no telephones, no internet, no text messaging, no WhatsApp, no Instagram, none of that is going on. You're insecure with your life, you're insecure with your future. And God looks at you and says, I know the plans I have for you. And you're not going home tomorrow. Matter of fact, you might not go home during your lifetime. It might be your kids or your grandkids that go home. 
But I know the plans I have for you. Plans to bless you. Plans to prosper you. Plans to give you hope. To give you a future. What are you talking about, Lord? Here in Babylon? I'm going to be buried here? I might not ever see my family again. God says, I have plans for you. Plans to prosper you. Plans to bless you. Hey, here's what God says. This is a life-changing principle, church. If you catch this, it'll transform your life. Catch this. God's plans for your life are better than your plans for your life. God's plans for your life are better than your plans for your life. Brian, it doesn't make sense. What are you talking about? I'm talking about a sovereign God who knows you better than you know yourself. I'm talking about a sovereign God who knows that he wants to take you from point A to point whatever. I'm talking about a sovereign God who knows what he wants to accomplish in your life far better than you know what you want to accomplish in your life. And in the midst of captivity, in the midst of exile, in the midst of 70 years in a foreign land, God says, I know the plans I have for you. Oh, they're fantastic plans. They're plans for your welfare. They're plans for hope. God's plans are better than yours. And if you will trust him in the midst of the uncertainty, God at some point will show his plans in your life. I, God taught us that principle about 22 years ago. 22 years ago, we were in Mexico City as missionaries. Amber was born. Amber was about two years old. We were, we were moving towards the greatest moment of our ministry. We were church planting missionaries in Mexico City, and we had worked for about five or six years to build a church, to buy a huge task of buying a piece of property, of raising the funds to build a church building that... that it's going on today. They're preaching in it this morning. And we were moving into that building that weekend. Vicki and Amber were in the States. I was there, all these huge plans. The night before we were supposed to move into that building, biggest day of ministry in our lives, Vicki calls and says, Brian Amber almost died last night. She's in the hospital. You got to come home. I was, I was ticked off with God. I've been a, I spent a night like Jacob arguing with God. How dare you? How dare you treat us this way? We've left our home. We've left our families. We're here in a foreign country. We're trying our best to serve you. You not only give us a daughter that has problems, but in the midst of this, the most important day of our ministry, this is what you do. couldn't sleep that night. I grabbed my Bible and you, you ever try to find something in your Bible that just doesn't speak to you? It's like you're reading a foreign language. And that night I grabbed my Bible and everything I read was a foreign language. Made no sense whatsoever until I got to Psalm 37 and verse 23 in which the psalmist says this, the steps of a good man are established by God and he delights in his way. And that night, God had taught me a lesson, taught us a lesson that has guided and guarded our life for the last 22 years, that God's plans are better than our plans. Might not make any sense to us, but that doesn't mean that it doesn't make sense to God. 
You might be here today and say, Brian, man, that's exactly the way I feel. I feel like I'm in exile. I feel as if God has abandoned me. I feel like my future is bleak. I feel like God has forgotten about me. I feel like God has abandoned me. I have no hope. I have no plans. I have no idea what God is doing in my life. I don't deserve this. And I would sit back and I would tell you today, God has plans for you. He has plans for your future. And his plans are better than yours. And at the end of the day, at the end of the day, what he wants to accomplish in your life is far greater than what you want to accomplish in your life. And I say this with a heart of gratitude today. If it wasn't for God's plans for Amber that were different than ours, I wouldn't be in Hollywood today. I would be somewhere else. 22 years ago, it didn't make sense. Today, I still struggle with it a little bit, but I know that God's plans are better than mine. That's what he tells the Israelites. You might not know what God's doing. You might be frustrated in the the city where God has placed you. You might wish God would lift you up and transport you somewhere else, but God has you right where he wants you. And his plans for you are better than your plans for you. Let me give you one final thing and I'm done. The best way to seek peace, the best way to seek peace is to seek Jesus. I love verse 13. Verses 12 and 13, then you will call upon me, then you will call upon me and come and pray to me and I will hear you. You will seek me, and you will find me. What does he say? You will seek me, and you will find me when you what? When you seek me with all your heart. God, are you in Babylon? I thought you were just at the temple in Jerusalem. How can we worship you in a foreign land? Our temple isn't here. The sacrifices aren't here. Some of the priests are here, but all of the religious customs that we know aren't here. God says, oh, if you seek me, if you seek me with all of your heart, no matter where you are, you will find me. Oh, church, God doesn't play cosmic hide and seek with us today. He, he doesn't do the old shell game where we're trying to find his will and he's, he's taking pleasure out of hiding it from us. He doesn't do that. God says, listen, if you seek me with all of your heart, you will find me. And not only will you find me, but when you find me, you'll call to me and I will answer you. And when you find me, you will experience shalom. Yeah even in a dark place. And when you find me, together, together, we can seek the welfare of the place where I have placed you. Church God has us here at this time and at this place for a purpose. I believe with all of my heart that purpose is to make a difference, not only in my life and yours, but to make a difference in our city, not for our glory, but for his glory. And may he use us far above and beyond our abilities to see a community changed for Jesus.